Good morning, church. Welcome. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. Let's stand up. Let's get ready to worship. It is a great day to be here. All your smiley faces. Let's go. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. Why don't you turn to your neighbor really quick and say, you are the best part of my week. <laughs> you better make sure that you're choosing wisely who you say that to. If you're married, that better have been your spouse. If you're a kid in here, it should be your parents. We're just so glad you're with us this morning, church. God is so good, amen. God is faithful, amen. We're just so excited for what God is doing in this place. How many people know that this is a great church? If you don't know that, that's all right. You can go back to sleep, wake up again in a better mood. But 
and uh, we're just so glad that God is here. Let's just pray together. Father, we come before you this morning, my God, just knowing that you're in this place, God, that you want to meet with us. And God, we want to meet with you today. So Father, this morning, God, take us and mold us into who you called us to be. God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to receive what it is that you want to say to us this morning, Lord God. God, if you're moving and you're changing, you're doing something inside of us this morning, Lord God, we welcome that, Lord God, because we know that you're at work inside of us. God, your word says that you is began a good work, is faithful to complete it. So, Father, this morning, move us further, further along in that process, we pray. We love you and praise you in your name. Amen.
hope will always be your promises to me. Church, let's just worship him this morning. Let's lift our voices and praise him for his goodness in our life.
darkness I called your name into darkness your mercy came you called me out you lifted me up how great is your love you bear my weakness and took
church. If you're unfamiliar with what happened, the Bible talks about the fact that God speaks through his people. So thank you, Bill, for shaving, or sharing that. We are believe that that's a word for us this morning. As we were, it kind of ties in with what I, I feel like the Lord is putting on my heart as well. As we were in worship time, I was trying to say, okay, God, what do you want me to share when I get up there? Um, sometimes it's crystal clear, other times it's not. And I had all these thoughts, like I had like 20 different thoughts bouncing around in my head. I could share this, I could go this route. And uh, I was like, Lord, I just need to hear what you want to say to the pe- like to the people of our church this morning. And the Lord, Lord just, uh, just really clearly said, you know, that is like a picture of a lot of us uh, is we are going through life and there's so many things bouncing around in our heads and so many things that are, that are happening and so many things that we can look to to try to fulfill us or bring us satisfaction. And I'm guilty of this even this week, just things that I've tried. I'm like, man, if I could just have more of this, if I could just do this, then I'll be happy or then I'll be relaxed or then I'll be this, then I'll have peace or joy. And um, I was reading in Isaiah and uh, there was this passage I was talking about a, a different people, the people of Moab, and they were about to go through a difficult season. And it says this, it says, the people of Moab will worship at their pagan shrines, but it will do them no good. They will cry to the gods in their temples, but no one will save them. And what, and what that verse is talking about is the fact that the people of Moab were going to go through a difficult season. And they started looking to all these different places that they think would bring satisfaction or peace or protection or joy. And what God was trying to tell them is that he's the only source of that. And as we're singing this song, How Great Is Your Love, I felt like this is a reminder for somebody here today that you've spent a lot of time the past week, the past month or two, looking at something else and saying, if I just had that, then I will be happy. Then I will be satisfied. Then I will have what I need. And what God is saying today is that just come to me. That's what God is saying. Just come to me because my love is so great because I love people that just want to pray and seek my face. Like all I want to do is bring you my love. That's what God is saying to you this morning. And so let this be a reminder today that your satisfaction, that your protection, that your joy, that your peace, that your hope can lie in nothing other than God himself. And for some of us, we just need to really take a moment and just say, okay, here's this thing I've been going after in my life. I choose to set that aside and refocus my eyes on what will really bring me satisfaction and peace and love and joy and all the things that I really need in my heart. So I'm going to pray that blessing over our church this morning. But I would invite you, if that's you today, to engage with God's presence Um, engage with God himself while I'm praying. You pray and say, God, I'm I'm sorry. I want to take my eyes off of those things and put my eyes back on you. Because the more, the more, the world will always tell us that there's things that will satisfy us, but only God himself can truly satisfy us. Only his love is great enough to bring us the satisfaction we need. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in, in our service. We thank you that you're a God that calls to us first. God, you loved us first. You said you opened the door for us to have a relationship with you first. God, we thank you for that. We thank you that we don't have to kick the door down, Lord. You did. And God, I pray, Lord, as all of us like are going through a difficult time, God. 2020 has been a difficult season. Lord, I pray, God, that we wouldn't look to other things. I pray that we wouldn't be like the people of Moab. They really thought that those things could protect them and save them and bring them hope and joy. But God, they couldn't. They were looking in the wrong place. God, only you can protect us. Only you can bring us joy. Only you can bring us healing. God, only you are the one who will satisfy our souls. So God, I pray that you'd help us to put our focus on you. God, to set our hearts on you. To seek you with everything that we are. God, because it is only you and your love, God, that can bring us what we need. So God, today I pray that if any of us individually have had a struggle with that lately, God, that you would help us to just release those other things, to step into what you're doing, God, to rest in your love. God, and may your love just rest on people's hearts today. Lord, bless the rest of this service. God, bless Pastor Steve as he speaks. And God, help us to be in touch with what you're doing this morning. We thank you, God. We pray your blessing over this service. In your name. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. I am Pastor Tyler. 
I am the youth and associate pastor, and it is so good to have you here with us this morning. And um, I just want to share a, a stupid little joke that I saw on the internet today. And uh, I thought it was pretty fun, so I'm just going to share it with you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, do you know where we get all our dad jokes from? From the database. Anyway, okay, just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so feel free to use that. If you're, your kids are in kids' church dads right now, so you can use that, and they don't know that I shared it with you. And you can make them roll their eyes and groan just like you rolled your eyes and groan this morning. Bring them that life and joy. All right, um, that has nothing to do with anything. Hey, tomorrow night we have an awesome uh, prayer time that we want to invite you to. It's going to be right in this room uh, tomorrow night. Uh, we are going to be doing prayer from six, uh, starting at 6.30, and we are going to be uh, praying for our nation. Do you guys know there's something happening on Tuesday this week? Um, I don't know if you, yeah, I don't know if you, you may have missed that, but there's something happening. No, we're going to pray for our nation as the election season comes up, and just pray for God's blessing and, and his healing in our land, and it's, it's going to be a powerful time. We did this a few uh, weeks ago as a corporate body, uh, and it was fantastic. So we would just want to invite all of you out to that. That's happening at 6.30 tomorrow night uh, because it is election eve. <laughs> and so uh, great holiday in our, in our nation. Um, uh, also, I'm sorry. I don't know why they give me a microphone sometimes. Um, <laughs> next Sunday, men, if you're here, just give me your manliest, ugh. There we go. Thanks, Brad. That was super manly. Uh, uh, so next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, um, we are doing Destination Burger. We are not meeting here to carpool. We are just meeting in St. Cloud. I think it's called Cyril's. I, I, I don't know. Cyril's. Okay. At the burger place. All men that are 13 years old and up, you are invited to come out to Destination Burger. All it is is we go and we out to a restaurant and eat burgers and hang out and have a good time. <laughs> it's, the, it's seriously great. I have a great time every time I go. Um, and so that is happening next Sunday night. Men, you are all invited. and We'd love to have you there. Um, and then I have a couple more for you. I'm sorry, this is a marathon this morning. Uh, Operation Christmas Child boxes are still out there. The due date for that is November 15th. It's coming up quick. So grab some boxes and fill those uh, so that we can give them to children in need all around the world. Uh, and then I just want to say as a, as a pastor here at this church and, and on behalf of our entire pastoral staff, thank you so much for the uh, gift baskets and the pastor appreciation that happened last week. Yes, and that it's, it's fantastic to um, uh, be able to pastor at a church where, where we really feel loved and supported by the congregation. And, and so those, those were so thoughtful and we were all blessed by them. So thank you uh, from us as a pastoral staff to the church for investing in that. All right, last one. Uh, we have a volunteer of the month this month, uh, and it's Danielle Hummel. Danielle, you can come on, come on down. Um, she's got a ways to come. So, so at here at Bridgeview, we have some amazing volunteers, and we like to take uh, a time uh, once a month about to just honor different ones. Danielle, uh, she works in kids, and she does a million other things here around here. And so she's just been pouring out and pouring out, so we just wanted to honor her. Thank you so much for all you do as a volunteer. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We actually had to go have somebody substitute for her because she was volunteering in kids this morning. So uh, just to get her in here for this. So, Danielle, thank you for all you do to bless Bridgeview Church. You are a blessing to us. And finally, that is all I have for you this morning. So I believe there's a video as a transition. You go wrong. I vote. I go home. Did I make it? Yes. Name and address. Mike Donnelly, 612 Caswell Street. Thank <laughs> you. 
okay. It's okay, man. I, uh... Here you go. I'm sorry. Here you go, man. That is my fault. I'm... Here you go. Here you go, ma'am. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh! Don't, don't, stupid! Darn, what are you doing? <laughs> Who'd you vote for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I love that this morning. You're like, whose idea was that? That's all my fault, okay? So you can blame that on me this morning if you'd like to. But uh, hopefully, but really, seriously, I, I wanted to encourage you to get out and vote. Vote, vote, vote. It's so important to get out this week if you've not done so already. I, I, I read a stat this week that, of course, I think a lot of us probably have at some point, that a lot of people, a lot of believers especially, believe that their vote doesn't count, so they don't vote. And, and of course, I, I wouldn't can ask you, because you probably would say, that's me, I don't vote. But if that is you, I would encourage you to get out and vote. And, and I'm not going to tell you who to vote for this morning, but I do encourage you to vote for the person and the persons that best uh, go through and best walk through what God's word teaches about how countries and how nations are led. And I want to make a, a quick, and this is not a long thing, but I want to make a quick thing. There is a thing that concerns me about what's happening in our country. And this is a great, and this is a massive opportunity this week for us to make a difference. And, and this is what it is. And, and it's, it's not a, a borsal, that's, that's a terrible thing. It's not all those. What, this is what it is, is that our nation, and there is, a, there is a group in our nation that is strongly moving towards this belief and this idea that socialism is a good thing. Now, again, you're like, some of you are like, that's right. Some of you are like, oh, no, where is he going this morning? Well, I, I, I had the mic, okay? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding around this morning. But, but no, I read a stat this week that, was, that startled me, and it said that, that the fastest growing subset of our nation's political landscape are people that believe in and espouse and believe that one of the things that will fix our nation is a move to socialism. And I want to tell you today, that is absolutely dead wrong. Now, you might be here today, you might be saying, well, I, I agree with that. I'll, I'll do this today. If that's, if that's you, I'm not going to make you raise your hand. I would love to sit down and have coffee with you. Socialism has never been a friend to not only religion, but also free thought and belief. And, I mean, there's a, a myriad of reasons why it is a terrible deal. Not the least of which is economical, but that's literally not the only thing. There are so many reasons why that's a bad, bad deal, okay? This election is a watershed moment in this nation for that. I, I believe that with all my heart. And so I want to encourage you to get out and vote, get out and make your voice heard as you hear so often in, in our culture. But I want to encourage you to vote thinking about what our future holds. Amen? It's a, it's a big deal. Now, that being said, God knows already who's going to win, right? God's not like, oh, no, what's going to happen? No, God knows what's going to happen already, and God is fully able, and it doesn't matter which side, left, right, up, down, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter which side wins or loses. God is in control. God is on the throne. Amen. And, and the, the hope of our nation isn't your favorite candidate, okay? Because I might have this morning had, had make you mad already today, and that's fine. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's not your favorite candidate, right? It's not. Your favorite candidate is a subset of what God has put on the throne. And God's on the throne this morning. And so, you, you know, and that, this church may be ecstatic next week. We may be not ecstatic. We, you might be here. You might be saying, I'm going to be so happy if this person, that. it doesn't matter as much. And the, 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 what matters more is that the church is united. The church is, 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 is working towards what God has called us to do. And that is to speak the gospel gospel in our culture. Man, this is such a big deal today. And this really, this morning, leads me so well into what I'm preaching on this morning. Today I'm talking about Satan, the fall, and the origin of evil, part two. 
So again, the most, absolutely most, uh, best, most compelling sermon title you've ever heard, part two this morning, right? No, I'm, I'm being serious today. God, God is really, really working in this series. And I've heard from so many of you who have been so thankful for us walking through this and frankly going into the deep end of the pool. That's what we're doing through this, this series. We are taking a deep dive into some stuff that is a big, big deal. So we're building a lot on last week. If you missed last week, I really want to encourage you to go online, listen to it on a podcast or on video. You can get it any one of those ways. Uh, if you're home uh, and you didn't listen last week, I encourage you to get to, get to do that as well. Uh, because today somewhat piggybacks off what we did last week. And so this morning, we're going to focus in on our enemy today, Satan. And I think this is an important thing. It's, it's, a, it's a valuable thing because when it comes to beating your enemy, when it comes to defeating your enemy, it's important for you to know who your enemy is, right? And how your enemy operates. And again, this is a, this is a really big deal because when it comes to Satan, I think people oftentimes make one of two mistakes. And this, this includes the church. Some people give Satan, give the enemy, a whole lot more credence than, than he actually deserves, a whole lot more power than he actually does by blaming too many things on him. For instance, let's say you got up late yesterday morning or, or Friday morning or whatever it was, and you got up late and, and, and you, you, you drove into work, you, you missed your exit, uh, you just had a terrible day, you got there late, your boss fired you, and now you said, Satan made me lose my job. No, what didn't make you lose your job. What made you lose your job is you got up late, right? So that, that happens sometimes. Or, for instance, maybe you might have stolen some money from your grandma, $10,000, and you're like, man, I stole some money from my grandma. Uh, you know, and I got busted. Satan made me do it. No, you stole $10,000 from your grandma. That was dumb. Uh, maybe last night you didn't sleep because Satan woke you in the middle of the night and you just couldn't sleep all night. No, that wasn't Satan. And Lester Cat's name is Satan. Which would be a good name for a cat, by the way, whatever. But, 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 but no, it wasn't, it wasn't Satan. It was, it was your cat that woke you up. Let's just be honest today. And some of you are like, don't you have two cats now? Yes, I do. Long story. I'll tell you, I'll tell you someday. But yes, I do now have two cats. Whatever. But, but, I, uh, but this is a massive problem. It really, really is. Because what happens in this, in this situation is that we give the enemy more ability and more power than he deserves to have in our lives. What it does as well is it, is it fosters a spirit of fear, a spirit of, of anxiety in people's lives where we give up what God gave us. Now, we're going to walk through that, what that is today, of course. But so, so that's the first kind of part of what people sometimes do. The second part today is that people dismiss and or underestimate Satan. Now, I think this is probably the more powerful and the more common of the two issues. Many people are blindfolded. Man, believers and non-believers are blindfolded, living their lives, running through a minefield, and they're thinking all along, they're dancing through a playground. This one, frankly, is far more common. 70.6% of Americans say that they are born-again Christians. Now, we know, of course, that number is not probably entirely accurate, but that's what people respond to. But listen to this. Only 56% of American Christians believe the devil is real. So almost half of American Christians do not believe the devil is real. And this is even more staggering, to be honest with you. And further, a whopping 43% of Americans who believe the devil is real believe he's not, well, believe he's real, but he's actually just a symbol of evil and not an actual being. So what that tells us is that a full 13% of Americans in this country who are Christians, only 13% of people believe in the devil as what the word of God teaches us about the devil. So like, why talk about this? Well, that's the reason. Because cover to cover, if you read the scriptures, the Bible paints a very clear picture of who our enemy is. A, a clear picture. He was created by God as a powerful guardian angel who rebelled against God and, and actively hates God and opposes his plan. And I, that's all I'm going today. You're like, if you weren't here last week, you're like, well, come on, I need more. Well, listen to last week's message. We get really deeply into that last week. But, but, but where does evil come from? That's where evil comes from. It's not created. God didn't make evil so there'd be a yin and a yang and up and down. No, that's not how this works. Evil comes from rebellion against God and his perfect plan. That's what the enemy did. 
That's what Satan did, and that's what he leads us into as well. This is a massive problem in our world. So your question might be, why, why talk about this? That's a great question. Here's a great answer. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And that's, that's such amazing imagery of what the enemy does. Now, I've been to Africa and seen, seen lions literally out, in the, uh, out in, in, in the wild, and I've seen them kind of do this. Now, thankfully, I was in a jeep far away from one, but I did see a lion quite a bit away who was lurking up on some wildebeest out in the field. Now, thankfully, the wildebeest knew he was coming, and they all took off and ran, but it was kind of an interesting thing. The, 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 the imagery here basically is that they didn't know what was happening at first. That's why the enemy prowls and looks for someone to devour, because the person that is being devoured has no idea what's happening. That's the imagery that the Bible teaches us about Satan. In John 10, 10, Jesus says Satan is a thief. He comes as a thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I got to tell you today, I have good news. You do not have to be stolen from and you do not have to be devoured. How? Well, as it continues here, it says resist him, stand firm in your faith. James 4, 7 agrees, says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, again, I want to just say, speak this again, because you might, again, be saying still, why really does it have to be like this? Maybe you were here last week, and you did listen to the message, and you thought, that makes a lot of good sense, theologically, but still, God is big and God is strong and God is powerful. God can certainly do whatever he wants to do. So, so why is things the way that they are? Why, why is there evil? Why is all these things happen? If you're with us today and you're, and you're not a believer and you're like, yeah, well, that's a great question. You know, you know, if you believe in this good God who can do whatever, how can a good God allow evil to happen in the world? And so that, those are great questions. A lot of people have all over the world, not just Christians, but people all, all over. Why is it like this? And we got this last week a, a little bit. I'm going to bear it repeat, it bears repeating here. God, God made the world and God made the world his greatest creation until he made you. You are even better than the earth. You are God's prized creation. Look to your neighbor, your spouse, and say, you are God's prized creation because you are, right? Now, some of you are like telling your spouse the first time, right? If you don't have a spouse today... Find someone maybe you want, you want to be your spouse. No, I'm just kidding around. But, but no, if you're single this morning, no, I, no, you know, you are God's prized creation. Married, not married, rich, poor, old, young, whatever you are this morning, you are God's prized creation. God formed you and God created you and God made you to work in conjunction with him to oversee and to rule this planet that he made. This planet is number two best creation. God loves you so much and he gave you the, the, the ability to work over this, this, he calls this and he works through this idea as dominion. This is what John chapter, I'm sorry, Genesis 3 talks about. And so, so God did this, but Satan Satan, of course, hated this. Satan thought, how about me? I'm pretty great. I'm pretty awesome. How about me? And so Satan rebelled against God. And Satan, ever since that time, has been trying to pull mankind into the same rebellion. Why? Because he hates God, and he hates you, and he hates God's plan. Now, that's kind of how this works. And again, you might think, that sounds, again, good, but... It's still very theological. How does this relate to me and my life? And to illustrate today, I'm thinking about my dream car. Now, I have lots of dream cars, to be honest with you. Uh, it changes with the day. I'll just, it just does. But Because I love cars. But this right now, this has been my dream car since I first laid eyes on this car several months back. And so what you're seeing right here is you're seeing a 2020 uh, Mustang GT 500. This is an incredible car. I would love to have this. Of course, this one here has a stick shift. It better have a stick shift. Uh, no sissy, you know, automatics like Dodge makes, but whatever. You know, the, 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 the horsepower on this is 760 horsepower. That is an incredible amount of horsepower. The top speed on this car is limited at 180 miles an hour. 
Now, for this message, I did research on this car. I, I had to. It was part of my job. But, you know, so I watched some videos um, on this car. And so what I did, I saw these videos, and I was like, I, I wonder if 180 is, is really top speed. And so I was watching videos on this, and these guys are driving this car on airports, and they are just absolutely cruising, and they are getting to 180 without any trouble. Just bam, there they are. And they all said the same thing. They all said, you know what? This car has a ton more room in it. I just wish we could get rid of the limiter. And so, so I don't know how fast it goes, but it's plenty fast, much faster than 180 miles an hour. It's an awesome car. I'd love to have one. So if any of you have about $130,000 laying around, there you go. Past your appreciation right there. But no, that's, that'd, be, that'd be great. That'd be great. But, but anyway, uh, let's... Let's say today that I actually do get one, okay? Let's say that somehow I, I get one of these cars, but not just any one. I get number one, numero uno, the top car, the first one off the line. It is literally a priceless car. There will never be another 2020 Mustang GT500, number one. And actually, that's what this one here is. This is number one. The guy in the picture there, uh, his name is Craig Jackson. He owns uh, Barrett Jackson Automobile uh, um, uh, Auctions, and so he is obviously quite wealthy. He, he bought this car, he, auction, he bought it in an auction, imagine that, for $1.1 million. And that was just because nobody else bid on it. The car is priceless. It's going to go up in value. That's actually him alongside to cut it off, but the car next to him is the 60s version of this car as well. An incredible vehicle. Let's say I knocked him off and I got this car myself, right? right? Let's, say, let's say I did that. Um, I, I would love it. It would be amazing. I would have so much fun with this car being my, it would literally be my, one of my, my prized possessions in life. But I'll tell you this this morning. I'm a dad. I have some, some kids. I have a wife and I have some kids. And I'm going to tell you something. I have some things I like in life, but there is nothing that I love more than my family. I, it just isn't. And so I have two girls, and, and, and both my girls, when they're 10 and 8 right now, uh, they also like cars as well. And so let's just say for the sake of fun this morning that I've had this car now for a while, and my oldest daughter turned 16, and she says, Daddy, I want your car. And I do the unthinkable, I say, you know what would be fun? If I give it to her. So I tell my daughter, I say, sweetie, I say, I'll tell you what. I want you to, want you to meet, me out, meet me out at this spot at this time. Um, I'm going to show up and I'm going to have something for you. So she shows up and, and I pull up in my, in my car. She has no idea what's coming. I pull up my car and, and I get out of the car and I say, sweetie, I love you so much. I love you more than anything else in the world. And so guess what? Today's your 16th birthday. Here you go. I throw the keys to my car. Now, you might say, why would you do that? Well, the reason is, is because I love, why would, why I would love this car. I would, I actually love her more. And I would, I love her more, and she's my daughter. And I would expect, now kids, if you didn't listen up now, I would expect that if I gave my daughter this car, I could still ride in it. And I would expect that hopefully, not only would I could still ride in it, but we would, we would ride together and enjoy rides together. And so I'm thinking about all this wonderful stuff that I can do with my daughter in this car. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have fun. To be honest with you, I'm going to watch her drive and watch the smile on her face. She's probably going to love this so much. It'll make my joy of my purchase even stronger and even better. And the reality is she's going to get it someday anyway. So why not do it now and enjoy it a little bit? So, so I, my instructions are very simple. I say, sweetie, I don't have a whole lot of rules for you. The world's your oyster. And truthfully, you can go faster than cops anyway. So you can go as fast as you want. Just, you know, go as fast as you can because you can beat them all out. You know, so show the sissies. You think Dodgers are better. Who's the boss? Right? But, but I do have one instruction for you, okay? One instruction. If a guy comes along and says, I want to drive your car, you say, no way. You say, that car is special. That was a gift from my daddy, and my daddy said, nobody else drives the Mustang. Now, so I tell her that, she says, great, daddy, that sounds awesome. And so I say, hey, sweetie, have fun. And I smile as she pulls off and lays down a patch of rubber a mile long. I said, that's my girl right there. You know, I'm like, oh, come on. She lays that patch over, I watch her enjoy this. It's, it's going to be an amazing thing. Now, now, here's the deal. A car like this is going to garner some attention. And, and it does. A guy comes along. But not just any guy, 
The salesman, the, the snake in the grass salesman who sold me the car, he was jealous the whole time. The entire time we were dealing on this, he wanted the car for himself and he wanted to buy it. He wanted it. He thought it was so cool. And he's like, he's telling me about all the things he could do and, and he wanted the car, but he couldn't get the car. The car is mine. But the truth is, he still wanted the car. And so he comes along and he finds my daughter and he says, Hey, nice car. Can I drive? And she says, Uh uh-uh. uh. She says, This car is my daddy's. This car is mine, mine, and my daddy's. He said, No one drives. Ain't going to happen, buddy. He says, oh, come on, That's, that car is so cool. Just, just one little drive. And she says, no, come on, one little drive. No, and just no, 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 no. And over and over again, she, he tries and he tries and he tries and it doesn't work out. And then, so finally, finally he comes to and he says, he says, hey, do you know who sold that car to your dad? She says, who? She says, he says, me. I'm the salesman. He shows her a picture. He says, this is me in the car. He says, I sold the car. He says, I know things about this car that even your daddy doesn't know. There are things that this car can do that your daddy did not tell you it can do because he doesn't want you to die. And so here's the deal. He says, if you just let me ride along with you, I'll tell you about those things. And she says, "Uh uh-uh. He says, you know what your daddy wants? He He just wants to hold you back from fun. Let me just come along with you. She thinks, and she says, well, it's not driving. I mean, it doesn't matter that much, I guess. He just rides along with me. And so he pops in the car, and he drives, and he rides along, and they, off they go. And like a movie, they fall in love. Stinking. Th- uh. They fall in, in love. <laughs> and now he's got her, so he thinks. He says, he says hey, hey, I, I want to drive. And she says, no, 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 he can't drive. And he says, I want to. And she says, too bad. And he says, now he, now he hits at her emotions, and he says, if you loved me, you'd let me drive. And she says, but I, I do, I don't need to drive. No, 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 if you love me, let me drive. You, why are you trying to hold back from me? And so she thinks, and she says, you know, she says, you're right, okay. And so he, she pops over to the side of the road, and she gets behind, he gets behind the wheel, and he takes her on the worst, most crazy drive that she could ever have found herself on. Now here, here's the backstory, and the story is this, the guy, that the salesman, doesn't care about her. He cares about the car. He, he, didn't, he didn't see a reason why he couldn't have it himself in the first place. He saw the fact that he couldn't afford it. So, so, so he, he wanted this car. And he said, the only way I'm, I'm going to get to this car is to get to the gift that, that, that this man has given his daughter. And so he says, I, I'm going to get it. And so he works and works and works and works and works and works and lies and cheats and steals and does whatever he can do to get that, that spot, this spot where he can to get behind the wheel of my car and drive it. Now, you might think you know the rest of the story. You'd probably be right. Again, they go crazy. It goes, goes long. It's, it's terrible, and she wants out, but she can't get out because he's behind the wheel. He's got the keys. He's driving. She can't get out. But you have to realize this morning that car is special, punk. And the truth, the truth this morning is this, is I don't care who you think you are. That car is still mine and my daughter's, and you can't have my car. You might have it now. You might have it for a season, but there will never be another number one. There will never be another one like that. And I have people in places that you do not know, and that car is coming back to the family, punk. That guy may be the ruler of the car today, but what he does not understand and know is though he has a measure of power today, that power and that time and that joy ride he's got is coming to an end. John 16, 11 says, the ruler of this world is judged. Listen, friends, Satan has a measure of authority and power today. He's got a measure of authority and power because what I just described is essentially what he did at the foundations of the world. But I got news for this morning. God is bigger and God is stronger and God is greater and God is the Father and God has things and ways that he does not know about. And Satan's on a joyride today. He's on a joyride with your life today, with this culture, with this world, but it is a seasonal thing. It is not long term because my God is greater. Come on someone this morning. Hallelujah. His time is coming to an end. Because you have to know today that Satan's power is not unlimited. 
It's not. It's boxed in. Satan is not omniscient. He does not know the future. This, listen, friends, he only knows what he hears, and he garners knowledge through that means. Satan does have a very sophisticated ability to think and to reason, probably in many ways better than ours is. But he only knows what he hears and what he is told. You have to be careful with what's your words and what you say, because the enemy is not in your brain and does not have access to your mind. Come on, someone this morning, that's how it works. Man, I find a lot of Christians don't understand that. They think Satan's in their mind, in their world. In, no, 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 no. That's not how he works. He is not omniscient. He's not, omnip- he's not omnipotent. He's boxed in. His power is limited. He has a measure today because he has the keys to the car today. But th- that day is coming to an end. He is not omnipotent. He is not omnipresent. He's limited by time and space. And he cannot be everywhere at once. That's why I can say that with confidence, Satan is not there, he's not there, he's not there, he's not over there, he's not over in Africa or Mexico or whatever else. Satan is limited by power or limited by time and space. He cannot be everywhere at once. Now what he does do is he does work through an organized and extensive network of fallen beings. We'll get into that in the coming weeks, but he is not omnipresent. He is not like that. You have to understand this morning. He's boxed in. He's subject to God always and especially, friends, in the life of a believer. Because when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, when he went to that cross so many years ago, and there's so much interesting, and I I actually had this whole thing on this, and I had to cut it out. There's so much today, but there is so much interesting verbiage and words in the, in the account in the Bible of what happened there at the, at the time when, when Jesus gave his life right down to the veil and the temple being torn in two. There is fascinating stuff that tells us that Satan has no hold on you, believer. When you come to Jesus, when you come to him, you give him the keys to your life. And Satan might have the keys to this world and to people around you. But that's why God says you have come out among them and you're different. The enemy does not have power and victory in your life unless you give that back to him. You have to understand that. This morning, 1 John 4, 4 says, little children, that's you and me, you are from God and have overcome them. Now, this is the spirit of Antichrist. This is Satan. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That is a bigger, stronger truth. So people might say, oh, Satan, maybe do this, and maybe do that, and all that. No, 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 no. If you're a believer this morning, Satan's power is limited, very limited, boxed in by what God has done in your life. Now, I want to move today just quickly this morning to show you about Satan's activity. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Now, we're going to have a ton of scripture. I'm not going to read all of them today because we'd be here a long time. And again, I, I cut stuff out so we get out of here at some point today. And, 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 and so I you know, want to give you that, that chance. But there is so much scripture that has to do with the work and the nature of the enemy in our lives. There just, there just is. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, says that we would not be outwitted by Satan. See, listen, friends. The power he has in your life is boxed in and limited. It is, it is, it is just, that's just how it is. However, you can be outwitted by Satan. You can find yourself in a place where, 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 where you've given him power and control in your life. This can happen. This does happen. It happens too often. And never, ever, ever, if you're a Christian, does it ever have to. Because as Paul continues, he says, For we are not ignorant of his designs. We don't want to be ignorant of how the enemy works, and so we want to be informed. And we're not informed by, uh, by a bunch of crazy ideas and things. We are informed what the Word of God teaches us about how the enemy works. And church, the Word teaches us a lot about the, how the enemy works. The first one I want to talk about today is Satan is looking for people to devour. And I've read this already today, but it bears repeating. Job 1.7 says, The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan asked, answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Again, this tells us he is not omnipresent. He roams and he looks and he searches. Satan is opportunistic. 
Satan is opportunistic. Satan is looking for those to devour. Here's a way to look at this this morning. Satan is looking for open doors in the lives of believers. He's trying to find spots and places where he can weasel his way into your life and weasel his way into a back door, a front door, a side door, a window, whatever else. He's trying to find open doors in your life. That's why he is searching. That's why he is roaming. That's why he is looking. He is opportunistic. For example, Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be angry and do not sin. and Do not let the sun go down on your anger. How? Give no opportunity to the devil. Here's one of the greatest open doors and opportunities the devil has in our lives. That open door is unforgiven anger. It's unforgiven anger. It's anger that sits there, and and anger is an amazing open door because so often we're angry because the person wronged us. How dare you? It's my, it's your fault, not my fault. I have every right to be angry at you. And see, don't you know that's exactly how the enemy wants you to think? Don't you know what that person did to you? That person wronged you. That person said this, that person did that, or that person. And and sometimes those things that they do are deep-seated, awful hurts. If I walked this room today and I sat down and you were honest with me, there's probably things in your life that you might be angry about that you have every right to be angry about. I I know how that works. I have those things in my life as well. The enemy's trying to find spots in your life, open doors and things in your life to come in and say, yeah, that's right, you were wronged. They did that to you, and so you have every right not to do what the Word of God teaches you and to walk in forgiveness. Can I be honest today, friends? One of the greatest tools I have found in my ministry of 20-some years now in full-time ministry, even more than that, is the enemy using unforgiveness in people's lives. And almost every time I talk to someone about this, they say, but pastor, that doesn't apply to me because you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what happened. You don't understand. If you can forgive that person, then you don't get what happened to me because what happened to me is far worse and far greater. So what it does is it causes you and gives you an excuse to say, God, what you said, what you did, doesn't apply to me. It's not my thing. It's not my, it's not my, my heart. And so we leave the door open for the enemy. We don't deal with the, our anger. And this brings us to number two. Satan lies and prompts people to lie. Listen to John chapter 8, verse 44. As Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, he, he says, this is what signals who you serve and who you follow. You are your father, the devil. And you're like, wow, that's pretty st- strong stuff. That's a pretty big deal. Jesus had strong words to people at times. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. That makes sense. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Some translations say out of his native tongue. For he is a liar and the father of lies. See, not only are Satan's words lies, but the Bible also tells us that his presence, his demeanor, and his very posture is a lie. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So this is what's going to happen in this situation. See, you may think you know how Satan works. You're like, oh, he's like this, you know, evil red horned beast, you know, and he's got beady red eyes. He's got a lot of fire. And he probably stinks. And, you know, he's got, a, he's got a pitchfork. And, you know, that's what the de- devil does, right? That's how he looks. And, and so, but the truth is, that's absolutely not how he looks. Because if that's how he looks, you would look at him and say, oh, no, 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 that's not, that's not for me. The Bible teaches us over and over again that the devil comes like this. He comes to try to help you and think that he is not nasty, he's not grotesque, he's not overtly evil, he's actually pretty nice and he's pretty good. It, it, it makes a whole lot of sense. It sounds right, it looks right, but it is wrong. And, and that's because his presence and his posture are lies. Man, uh, t- today, in our time and our culture, the enemy is working and is frankly being somewhat successful in people's lives, of making them think he's something that he actually is not. 
telling them something that's going to be great or good, or if you just do this or just do that, then life's going to be so much better. This is how he works. He comes from a posture of lying. This is how he works and operates. Again, he just does not come like this evil, grotesque thing. That's not how he is. He comes and looks really, really good, but he is wrong. So as it continues, it's no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Satan and his cohorts operate like this. They're not this deep, dark thing, although they, they certainly are those things. They come and they say, wouldn't it be good if you did this? See, if you just let me drive your car, I'll tell you all about that thing. You just let me show it because your father has no real concept of what it's like to really live. So I want to help you out and I want to show you some things about that car that your dad never, never told you. See, this is how he operates. Not only that, but he puts lies in the hearts of people. Acts sort of chapter 5, verse 3 says this. Said, but Peter said, Ananias, who's a Christian, why has Satan filled your heart with heart, filled your heart to lie? The Holy Spirit, and to, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. See, Ananias, open the door in a way that his influence comes out in the words you speak. See, friends, this doesn't just happen to people, to somebody else. This can happen to us as well. Number three, Satan tempts people to rebel against God. We talked about this last week, but there's a pain today. It's Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And this is the first time we ever hear Satan speak. He says this to the woman. He says, did God really say I, I, I don't know. See, t- Satan tempts people to rebel against God. This is how this works. Satan comes and he tries to make you think that what God said is not true. He comes with a, a spot of questioning God, questioning his word, questioning his call, questioning. Your dad told you not to let you drive the car, but he didn't really tell you everything. So he brings a word of question into your life. It's interesting, when you find Satan speaking and leading people away from God in the Bible, it always follows this same pattern. Even when he tempted Jesus, the exact same thing he says. He starts out with a question about God's character, God's integrity, God's goodness. Did God really say that? Did God really say that if you do this, then you're going to walk? And and did God really say that? Then it goes to doubt. See, he's not as good as he said he was. See, if you do what God told you to, your life's not going to be as great as he promises. If you walk in God's character and God's integrity, your life's going to stink. If you would just do this, things get much better, right? You're going to feel better. He goes to doubt, and then he goes to distrust. He's holding something back from you. Your father is not being honest with you, and then it goes full bore into disobedience. I know better. Do this and join in my rebellion. Remember, where does evil come from? Evil is not some far off, distant, created entity. Evil comes when God's God's people rebel against him. That's where evil comes. The enemy would love to have you join in his rebellion and walk in his evil. Church, people, friends, that's not what you were created for. God has a bigger thing, a bigger truth in your life. Satan tempts you to walk away from that and rebel against God. No more, not here, not now. Number four, Satan leads people away from a relationship with Christ. And this this morning is where I really... Uh, Bill, what, you, what your word today was spot on. And what's so fascinating today is the uniqueness of what it was. I actually wrote it down. It says, this is what it said. It said, I want you to try to pray. Because when you try to pray, I will answer mightily. Now, isn't that interesting that the word this morning was, I want you to try to pray. There's something about that that's very interesting and very unique. You see, Satan, Satan leads people away from a relationship with Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says this, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will also be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. You know how hard it is to spend time with God sometimes? It's hard, isn't it? You know what? I'm, your pa- I'm the pastor of this church. I'll be honest with you. It's hard for me sometimes to spend time with God. It just is sometimes. Because things get busy and this happens and this happens and and that happens and things happen in our lives. You know why? 
Because Satan would love nothing more than to lead you away from a close relationship with Jesus Christ. He knows the power. He knows the authority. He knows the blessing that comes in that 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes a day you have with God. Satan knows how terrible that is for him. So guess what? He tries to lead you away from that. So when the word this morning says, I want you to try to pray. God knows this is a struggle. God knows this is tough, but God also knows, and so does Satan, that time with him, that time in his word, that time in his presence, that time just between you and him, there is power, there is authority there in those those moments, and Satan would love nothing more than to lead you away from that, to walk away from that. So this morning, to go on that word, try, get into his presence and try if you're not right now. Because the promise is, and this is not just, What he said. This is what the word teaches us. The promise is he will bless that mightily. Because greater is he who is in me, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So when he wants to come along and he wants to take that out of you, it's too bad. He's lost already. Number five, Satan plucks the word of God out of people's hearts. Mark chapter 4, verse, verse 15 says, And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. We, we could spend an entire sermon just on this. No, I won't. I, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. But, 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 but no, no. We, we could this morning. We could spend so much time on this because this is so good, it's so rich, it's so, so wonderful. And the question you should ask yourself is, how do I keep my soil pure in this moment? It's a big question. See, the, the truth is that Satan comes along and plucks this out of people's hearts. That, that, that shows us that that soil, and if you look, if you go with that, that, that story that Jesus is telling, the soil is, is bad, it's hard, it's, it's full of weeds and full of things. You know how you keep the soil good in your heart? What, what spoils good soil is anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, and selfishness. See, this, this comes full circle. See, when you, when you work and when you protect the soil in your life, when you make the, the soil of your life to be fertile ground for God's word to find its place and grow and, and, and flourish and things go, things go well. See, the enemy wants that not to happen. So he comes along and he plucks the word of God out of people's hearts. You might say, well, why is my neighbors, why have they struggled to find Jesus? I've told them it doesn't make sense. They don't, I don't, they don't get it. I mean, why my kids or my grandkids or my mom or my dad or my whatever, why don't they seem to understand this concept? It's so clear. It's so awesome. Why can't they get it? Well, Satan comes along and plucks the word of God out of their hearts. It's literally what the word of God says. What spoils this soil is anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, and selfishness. Here, here's, a, here's a little pro tip for you this morning. This is somewhat off subject, but if you want to help your child or your mom or your dad or someone in your life that that you care about and you love, if you want to help them find and know Jesus, you know what you need to do first? You need to help them understand how to walk in forgiveness. So many people out there have the word of God. They know the word. They've heard the word, but that bitterness, that unforgiveness, that resentment has become such a stronghold in their life that it literally cannot take root. And sometimes the more you tell them, the harder it gets. The more you speak to them, you say, don't you know, don't you know? Yes, they do know in theory, but they don't understand because God's word has not taken root in their hearts. I will tell you this, that I grew up in church, I knew a lot about God, but until I knew and learned how to forgive someone else in my life, I never understood it until the day I learned how to forgive. You have to do that. That was for free this morning for someone. I don't know. But number six, Satan persecutes believers. Number six, Revelation chapter two says this. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. What does that say? That that says the devil's doing this. He, He says, you may be tested and for 10 days you'll have tribulation, but be faithful until death. I will give you the crown of life. As the band comes forward this morning, to begin to lead us in worship today. This happens all over the world. People are in prison because Satan put them there. You're like, really? That's really that's what the Word of God t- teaches us. 
See, we think that what happens here is it's just people that don't like Jesus or don't like religion or whatever else. But no, it literally says, the Bible says that Satan influences governments and leaders and systems and such to persecute believers and shut down their witness. Here's his big problem. Because he is not omniscient, he is not all-knowing, he's not, he's kind of dumb, let's be honest, because it always backfires on him. Because if you look throughout the course of history, when the church is persecuted, it's like throwing gas on a fire. It's like throwing diesel on a large, huge fire in your backyard. It is a huge mistake from the enemy to persecute believers. But he doesn't know that. He's not that smart, and so he tries, and he tries, and he tries. Because he's all-knowing, he tries. But number seven, Satan fights against the spread of the gospel. First Thessalonians chapter 2 says, We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we want to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan actively works against the cause of the gospel. See, I think even right now, the enemy's working in lives and in hearts. We prayed this morning that God would work and would minister in lives because Sunday morning is a great time for the enemy to come and pluck the word, to stop the word, to hinder the word from, from finding a spot in our lives and in our hearts. But don't forget, God's greater, and this is why we pray. The last one, as we close this morning, would you bow your head and close your eyes? Because the last one today is number eight, is Satan accuses. Man, you got to hear this this morning. Satan accuses, and not just accuses everybody, Satan accuses God's people. Zechariah 1, 3, 1 says, And then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, saying before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand, accusing him. Now, something amazing here that's happening you have to know who Joshua is. Joshua is the high priest of the time. And the context here is that Joshua is being accused as being unfit to be the priest. Joshua, you can't be the priest. You're, you're not qualified. You can't represent God's presence. It doesn't happen. That's what's happening in this place right here. Joshua is being accused. See, the enemy did this in the Old Testament, and he does this also in this time as well. Have you ever felt God encouraging something in your life? And all of a sudden, there's this little spot that says, hmm, you can't do that. You stink at that. You're going to fail again. You're going to try to have victory over that life again. You're going to fail again. You want to walk away from some lifelong sinful thing that's got you bound up and you know it's wrong and you know it's not good, you've tried and you've tried and you've tried to walk away. And guess what? You can't. You're too weak. It's not possible. And you say, where did that come from? The Bible says the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the saints. The accuser of you and the accuser of me. Don't give up. Don't give him an open door. See, when you know how he works and you know how he operates, that he is one who's looking for open doors for those to devour. He is a liar and props people to lie. He's one who tempts people to rebel against God. He is there to lead us away from relationship with Christ. When he is there to literally take the word out of our hearts. When he is there to persecute believers. He's there to fight against the spread of the gospel. And he accuses. It's no wonder why sometimes that happens. You don't have to do that though. That the truth this morning is this. And I've got greater and bigger news. First John 4, 4. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because as you stand across this room this morning, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? this morning? Would you speak that word this morning? That word's not mine. That word is the word of God who is literally powerful and active. Why don't you say it again this morning? Why don't you quote it today? Greater is he 
Great, do I like you mean it today? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. As 1 John 5 says, for God's son holds them securely and the evil one cannot touch them. Someone give God some shouts this morning because that's good stuff. Jesus, heads bowed, eyes closed this morning. God, we have said a lot today. Lord, we, this has been a teaching moment, Jesus, rather than a preaching moment. I know this morning, God, that some might be here today and they may not know you as their Savior. I have prayed for you this morning. We have prayed today that, first of all, you would not be lost in all this theological discussion, but that God would start to work in your life and would start to to turn the light on in your life as to why you feel and why you think the way that you think. Now this, this morning, the light may be coming on it's making sense for you in the first time. Why do I do what I do? Why can't I be happy? Why can't I be fulfilled? I've got all this stuff. Why can't I be happy with it? Because you have an enemy who hates you. And this whole time, this whole season is just to get there to try to take you away from the one who made you, who loves you, cares about you more than anything else. If that's you today, if that's your heart today, if you don't know Jesus is your Savior, I'm going to pray a prayer and I want you to repeat after me. Because the Word of God teaches us that if we, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, I mean, that, that we are saved at that point. And so this morning, I want to lead you in that prayer today. This prayer is not magical. This prayer is, a, is an example, and I want to encourage all of us to pray it this morning together so that that person would not feel that they are left out today. But we're all going to pray. But if that's you this morning, God's tugging on your hearts. I have prayed for you today. Now it makes sense. Come to Jesus. Christians pray, come to Jesus. I'm not going to promise you it will be always easy. I'm not going to promise you it's always going to be perfect. I'm not going to promise you riches, and I'm not going to promise you, uh, you know, joy and happiness untold. But I am going to promise you significance. I'm going to promise you relationship. I'm going to promise you that you will, at this point forward, understand that God has come to save you your soul. And that, friends, is the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I love you. I don't know you yet, but I love you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of everything I've done. That's wrong. From this point forward, I'm yours. I know I need you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Give God glory this morning for those who come to Jesus. Well, I'm done. You're like, wow, that's quite a way to end a message. I'm done, but God's not done. Let me tell you how much I've struggled over this message the last two days, last two weeks. There's a belief in, in, in modern churches and modern pastors that you don't want to hear what's deep. That what you want to hear is you want to hear a nice message that tickles your ears and makes you feel good and you're going to go home and that's what's going to happen. And the enemy's tried to tell me, Steve, you preach this message People are going to walk out and they're going to leave and they're not going to want to hear what you're going to want to say. But I can't get by it because I want you ready. I, I, I want you to understand the power that God's given you. That you don't have to, these things that Satan does, yeah, he, he does these things. Not one of them do you have to walk under. And I want to focus today on that part at the end that says Satan is the 
accuser. If you have felt the accusation of the enemy, if you've tried to walk away from something and you can't, if God's tried to call you to something and he's tried to call you to give or this or that, or God's tried to call you to speak or God, and you've failed in your mind and you said, ah, I can't do it anymore. And all you do when you pray is you feel this accusing ver- voice, this accusing nature. Now you know why. But you also know you don't have to walk in that anymore because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Again, the enemy wants, wants you to think that, wants me to think that you don't want to hear this stuff. But I, don't, I, don't, I disagree with that. I think you do. I think you're ready for this. And I think God has a thing for this church. Jesus, we lift up our hearts and our lives and our hands to you this morning all across this room. We acknowledge this morning, Lord, our, our humanity, Lord, and that's not, a, that's not a curse, it's a blessing. Sometimes we say that being a human is a curse. It's not a curse. Sometimes we give ourselves excuses. Well, I'm a human, so I, that's, just how I, that's just how it is. No, 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 no. God, you've called us saints. You have called us forgiven. You have called us set free from the law of sin and death. Jesus, this morning, I pray you would give us understanding into how these things work. Lord, we, we, we come together as a church this morning, Lord, to learn about how the enemy works. Lord, to be ourselves set free and then also to help other people be set free from this stuff. Lord, we acknowledge what your word says. The enemy is real as a measure of power. But we also, Lord, know the greater truth is greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So, Lord, that's we go forward this, this week. We may feel and sense that, God, things are lifeless and impossible. God, what might happen on Tuesday might make us angry and distracted and upset. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. We might have our greatest thing that, that literally every person we vote for could get elected. We might feel that now we have the hope and we still won't. Because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Lord, we know, we understand, we see today that you are the hope of the world. Lord Jesus, minister in us, work in us as we let this process in us this week, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Let's, let's just let God work for a moment. If you want to come to the altar today and just find a spot, Joe's gonna, and the band is going to sing this morning. Let's just let God just do something and then I'm going to close in a minute. But I just feel God wants to do some more this morning in this place. Jesus, Jesus. Amazing love that welcomes me. The kindness of mercy that bought with love wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. God, you're so
eyes closed this morning one more time. Jesus, we love you this morning. Jesus, we honor you this morning. We understand, Lord, a little bit more today about how the enemy works, but we understand in greater measure, and Lord, in more thankful measure today, God, how good it is that you came to this world and gave your life for us. Lord, we'd be hopeless, literally hopeless without that. All this stuff, Lord, all these things you talked about, Lord, is a daunting task. Unless you came, Jesus, and you did, and you gave your life, and that's the gospel, and I am thankful for that this morning. Lord, I pray over my friends here today. Even those that might be here this morning, that might be skeptics, and they'd say, I don't think so still. Does this guy really believe this stuff? And the answer to that is yes, I do. Because God has worked this in my life. Lord Jesus, I pray in every person in this room, you would give us a deep understanding of how these things work. Lord, a deep understanding, Lord, of our position in you. Jesus, as we go about this life and this day and this week, God, remind us, Lord, of what you've done for us. Lord, work in us. And the enemy comes to try to steal and kill and destroy what you've done. Lord, let, let us remind him that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And that's the final word because you said it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone shout this morning. Come on, somebody. Amen and amen. Man, God's good this morning, right? God is good this morning. If you've got a prayer need today, a prayer team, come on down front if you would. This will, we'll, be, we'll pray with you this morning. If you've got a prayer need today, if not, God bless you. God keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious. Thank you for jumping into the deep end of the pool with me today. I appreciate that. We'll see you next Sunday morning. God bless you.